Our panel is about machine learning in production. So we'll just do some quick introductions before we get started with questions. My name is Catalina Arango. I am a data scientist at Florida Power and Light. I work in the customer service business unit, specifically under our care center, which is our contact center. We work with a lot of customer experience data, um, with a lot of data from all of our customers that are calling us um, and contacting us. I'm also the Women in Data Science Ambassador for Miami. I host the annual Women in Data Science Conference here. And although it is the Women in Data Science Conference, we welcome um, everyone. So um, keep an eye out for that. That's in March. Awesome. My name's Rochelle March. I'm a senior analyst at TrueCost, which is part of S&P Global. TrueCost manages uh, a lot of the ESG, environmental social governance data. And I'm on the research and analytical team, so I manage a lot of our methodologies, models, and technical approaches. Uh, hi, I thank you for having me on this panel. My name is Hong Wang. I'm a data scientist at an independent purchasing cooperative, which is located in South Miami. So our company is a supply chain management uh, company, and we provide a supply chain service for Subway, which is the largest single brand restaurant chain. So, uh, um, so. Data science is, uh, is relatively new to IPC. I have been working with IPC about uh, two years. Most of our work is, uh, is to provide in-depth analytic insights or systematic applications, which can both to improve our current business. And we apply a mathematic approach to uh, answer business questions and enable stakeholders to make decisions based on analysis or recommendations. I'm Michelle Coca. Uh, I am a data scientist at MRM Bank. Um, basically, it's a community bank here in South Florida and in the Houston, Dallas area. Uh, I've been with the bank for four years, um, and we currently are in the business intelligence analytics team um, under marketing, and especially on the business side. So we don't really engage that much on the fraud or risk or BSA areas. We're more dedicated to um, upselling, cross-selling, and helping our business units um, create more business. Awesome. So, you know, here in South Florida, um, we have a, a different industry than, let's say, the Bay Area um, and, or New York City, right? We don't have as many tech companies or companies that are really leading in data science, right? That's the truth. So one of the things that companies are really looking towards now as they continue on their data science path is how they take, you know, traditional research and insights data science um, into production. Um, we just heard a lot about this in, in the previous talk. So can you tell us a little bit about how the companies um, that you work at are you know, operationalizing um, some of their machine learning models and some of the, the things that you're working on now? I can take that question. So uh, basically at IPC, how we build models and how we uh, evaluate the, uh, the efficiency of the models and how we production the, uh, the models, it really uh, depends on the business scenarios and it varies from one to the other. So in Subway restaurant, we have promotions throughout the year. So one promotion can last eight weeks. And uh, uh, the, the, the promotion forecast is the core to assure the success of our, uh, of our business, which can briefly summarize as uh, getting the right product at the right locations, uh, at the right timing, and with the right quantity. So uh, we have to tailor our uh, entire process based on the nature of our promotion. For instance, we have uh, some of our promotions are LTO promotions. And what does that mean? That means we are promoting one sandwich which has never been offered on, on our menu before. So therefore, we don't have historical data to help us to build the models. And what we can do is we take another sandwich uh, which has the similar protein or flavor. Uh, to simulate the daily sales of that uh, new sandwich we are going to uh, promoting, uh, we are going to promote. So, um, and until we have the real sales data coming in, then we can go, go back and tune the models uh, and uh, uh, make sure that it can uh, uh, make sure that it can work. And of course, by doing that, we have to sacrifice the accuracy a lot. Yeah, I think accuracy is a really good point. Uh, it's something you have to agree on with your team. You know, what is the 
uh, level of accuracy that's that's acceptable for your team because uh, you can sacrifice it very easily. I know for my company, it's a lot of developing an internal buying argument of why you want to bring something from a pilot into production. Um, and part of that, a big, a big part of that, I think, is interpretability as well. You know, how do you take something that is very specific to the data science community or the business analyst community and make that into a business case that then can be used by the other teams within the company? Um, I think that's definitely our, our biggest uh, point in terms of operationalizing some of our work. Yeah, the bank um, basically it starts with um, a request, a challenge that the line of business might have. And then based off that, um, we don't try to go into the details with them, what's behind the models, um, but we do try to give them like a layman terms, um, what it actually does and how it could really help them. And then kind of like operationalizing and deploying it. Um, right now we're still in the infancy of doing that. Um, mostly it requires around, you know, Excel, having the coefficients of the models variables. And then they all have to do is plug in a certain number on a spreadsheet and then they get the output. Um, but however, we're in the process of procuring uh, more enterprise data science platforms that will allow us to kind of deploy um, these machine learning models in a um, web resting API so they could go directly to that site and then just get the output from that in a more, um, say, quicker fashion. So kind of on that topic, along um, the line of tools, what are some of the tools other than, you know, maybe traditional spreadsheets and using just coefficients and, you know, the actual formula of the model um, that you're currently using to be able to share your models and actually put them in production with kind of the end users? Sure. Well, in the end users in terms of internal, we use Jupyter Lab a lot. It's really easy. We use our studio. Um, in terms of for the final client, I gave a presentation earlier with Dash. Uh, also, our Shiny is really nice for dashboards and things like that. Um, yeah, I think that's... Oh, one tool I really love for organizational processes is Airtable. It's kind of like a glorified Excel online, and you can attach attachments, and then you can share it with all the people in your team. It's really good for re research-based projects, for example. So that's another one. Oh, just a curiosity, is that free? It is free up to a certain point, oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like free stuff. <laughs> so uh, in IPC, what we have been uh, doing is we built a Cloudera data warehouse and uh, within the Hadoop environment. So uh, within that environment, we have three identical entities, which are dev, uh, st uh, stage, and uh, production, and a prod. So uh, once we are, so basically, it depends on what we want to do. We can decide the production uh, process, like where the production uh, process can stop. If we just want to do a simple architecture testing, we can just uh, stop our deployment uh, at the dev. And if we, uh, if we want to do the data exploration or uh, the model testing, we can just uh, stop our production process at the stage. And if we are ready to uh, the, the, the model production, we can just let our production uh, 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 process go all the way to the prod. And once we are done, uh, the big challenge for us is to make sure we are able to share uh, whatever is coming out from our uh, models to the stakeholders. And uh, so what we do is we implement the, the BI tools on our environment as well. Uh, they are uh, the Tableau and Macro Strategy. So by doing that, we can assure our stakeholders can access to the results any, anytime and anywhere uh, they, they want. Yeah, I, sorry, I just have one to add to is uh, HTO.ai. It's kind of a machine learning platform and it does auto ML. So it will automatically test a bunch of different machine learning algorithms. So sometimes for EDA and such, we'll use that. And that, I think, is also free to a certain extent, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it, it is free. Yeah, um, since the bank is very high on um, security and you know not letting um, customer data um, go to the wrong hands. We currently have, have been able to use open source data, um, data tools um, so far, so that's why it's been very um, Excel driven or if anything, we have to create a presentation with the results of the model for our C-level executives along those lines. So, but we're slowly moving towards you know maturing in our data science team and also educating um, our 
line of business, which are end users of the results of the model into a more streamlined process. So Michelle, you just touched on, on a keyword, right? Educating kind of the end users. And I think uh, for the data science life cycle and for companies that are earlier in their data science stage, that piece is really important and can really bring about a lot of challenges. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges maybe that you've faced in trying to bring your machine learning models to production and operationalizing them, having people actually use them, um, and kind of how you've dealt with them? Um, sure. Uh, most of the executives and the line of business have been working at a bank or at certain banks around the country and the region for maybe the past 15 to 20 years. So all these... Um, very smart, you know, capable of uh, managers, you know, know their business very well and don't kind of want to stray off of their your instincts that, you know, have guided them this far and led to so many success. And what we try to do is we try to do quick wins that augment um, their knowledge, their insight that will help them make a decision faster. So we try to uh, present it in a way that's going to help them and not replace what they feel or what they, or what they know from experience. Um, so that's one way we try to present it in that manner. Yeah, the same here because the, the natures of our uh, projects at IPC are two categories. The first one is to provide the in-depth uh, uh, analytic insight and these are the quick wins. And also we are trying to build the systematic applications to help the stakeholders to monitor certain KPIs anytime they want. And the challenge we're facing is to try to get the stakeholders understand uh, the, mo the outcomes of the models because they know their business very well. And uh, uh, they also know the struggles in terms of uh, uh, answering business questions. So uh, some of them are actually looking forward to the solutions coming out from the, uh, the, uh, the machine learning models. But if we just threw them off by laying out all the numbers, uh, that might not work in the end. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to interpret the models the way they are familiar with. And once they can perceive the information the way they are familiar with, it's really easy to get them on board. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think particularly with ESG data, it's a constant learning curve with clients. I had a client today actually apologize because she gave me such a hard time during the project is this water risk assessment and now she, it finally clicked and she was like, oh, I, I'm sorry, like, I get it. Um, <laughs> so there's a long learning curve, I think, just about what does this mean, carbon emissions and this water basin is essentially dried up by 2020 and you won't be able to use any water there and things like that. Um, but to your point, it's, I always package things, I find it most useful to package things in a tool or sandbox-like format. So with this particular client and others, uh, we did all this analysis, provided it to them, but I packaged everything into a tool that would relate to their financials really simply in a way that they understood. And then once they you know, used it to see if they want to do this water-related investment on this site or this site as for a strategic reason, it instantly clicked. And they were like, oh, I get why this data is important and why you spend so much time going over it. Um, so I think it's really just getting it into a format that they understand and that they think is also useful. So yeah, I think that that's key, kind of communicating in their language and making sure that it's visible to them in a way that kind of really makes sense. Are there any other recommendations or best practices or things that you do in your companies to kind of help facilitate that? You know, you touched a little bit on, on some, some of the things you do, but what about at Amarant Bank or, or at IPC? Um, for the most part, uh, we try to do um, very um, supervised learning models that kind of show them how we got from point A to point B. So one of the best examples I could give is um, a decision tree. From a decision tree, you know, we show them the most relevant factors or variables um, that could lead to a potential decision that means, you know, giving out a loan or not giving it a loan. And basically also using very impactful visuals um, through, you know, creating it through R, um, it, feel, it, feel, it seems to be um, ggplot2 has an answer for everything. If you want to animate things, you know, over time, that they love those animations, so they kind of see their business change. Um, so just ha give them a good visual of what what the model is trying to tell you and the insights from it. I think really help. Yeah, 
It's the same here because it's not only just a good visual, but also some good metaphor. Uh, what happens at IPC is we are dealing with the point of the sale data. We are also dealing with the data from the distribution centers and the manufacturers. And sometimes we are trying to monitor the inventory levels at the distribution centers. So some of the managers at IPC, they could enter like a visual, a visual that like the, uh, the inventory going in, uh, coming in and going out. So what we do is we just visualize the distri distribution center as a water tank and just think the inventory coming in as water coming in and the inventory going out is the water going out. And because this process is constantly going on, so you really cannot, uh, cannot just measure the inventory at the stat static level. So we have to measure things in the dynamic, dynamic status. So by using the water tank as a metaphor, it's really easy for them to visual how it works. Otherwise, it's getting a little complicated for them to perceive the information. About you, Rochelle, any other? Uh, visualizations, are, visualizations are amazing, uh, metaphors, uh, lots of examples and case studies I think are really helpful too. And what about pilots? Is that something that you tend to do at all? If there's ever a time when you know people really are not sold on the idea, do you ever kind of implement a, a short-term pilot, see how it goes? Yeah, for me, um, basically, um, we just recently did a new initiative, um, starting I think back in January, and we did a three-month pilot test to see how the results um, compared to the model prediction. And for the most part, um, you know, in the beginning they looked so good, it was very off. But at the end of at the end of the period, though, the results were very similar to what was predicted. So that was always a positive thing. And they became more um, confident in the model. And basically, we've been having it in production on a non-pilot um, sta um, status for the past, uh, when we're September, so maybe the past six months. So it's going very well. And they really don't have any qualms or any doubts or about it, the predictions because they know that over, over time, it's going to be what the actual results are going to be. So that's pretty good. It's the same here because uh, uh, what we did is like, uh, let me think another uh, metaphor. Because uh, recently we are trying to build the inventory monitor uh, uh, platform for all the distribution centers. However, we couldn't find the alignment between uh, all the distribu distribution centers, both in America and Canada. So what we decided to do is we will start something small. Uh, we focus on one distribution center in Canada first, and then once we get alignment from that distribution distribution center, and we just expand that approach to the entire Canada. And eventually, once we get more and more people on board, then we will expand that approach uh, to all the distribution centers. So that is how we, uh, uh, how we, uh, like how we uh, make that work. I think uh, TrueCost is particularly lucky um, in getting a lot of bespoke uh, requests from clients, for example. And so we'll often use bespoke requests as a pilot. And so we'll develop the methodology, the models, the data as part of our engagement with that client. And then if we see an opportunity, we can scale it out towards other things. So a really good example was a client that was interested in how carbon taxes were going to affect its operating margins. And so we developed a data set for that. We did the analysis. And then we said, you know, this data set's actually really great. Um, we should build this out. So we built a tool that we now sell on a subscri subscription basis to lots of other companies who are interested in this. And then we all, since we're part of S&P, we've also built an index <laughs> that looks at the carbon exposure of taxes uh, on an index uh, piece. And then now we've even expanded that now to um, uh, what's called the carbon earnings at risk. So you can look at a whole portfolio, what is going to be their carbon earnings at risk, essentially. So that was a good example of something that started as a bespoke request from a client that we then were able to pilot, scale, and find a lot of opportunities to then make more products and generate more revenue. So let's say you know you, you got a request, you developed a model, you put it into production, you know, we heard about model monitoring, um, but you are also going to need to update the model. So 
how do you approach updating a model that's already in production, especially if you don't have the tools and maybe you're not you know, a company that solely revolves around a tech product and you can just kind of deploy those updates. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we don't really get that of real-time data. It's more monthly, maybe even annual. Uh, one day that will change as we get more satellite data and, and really do the real-time bit. Um, so it's a real question, you know, do you compare the production data to the training data? What's the correlation? What's the threshold of that correlation with which you need to retrain the model? How can you do that continuously? Um, these are really good questions and things that we'll definitely have to face um, because it's, it's super important. Um, right now, we're really just updating the data and, and redoing the model, um, and there aren't really many changes, but eventually we'll need to look into that. So be because the system, the environment we have been building at the IPC actually can avoid uh, deploying the testing models to interfere uh, interfering with the production uh, uh, models. And so what do we do, as I mentioned before, is we have a three identical entities and the, uh, the dev and the stage and the uh, prod. And all these three entities have the, uh, in terms of the data content, they are all same to each other. So what do we always do is if we really want to make the changes inside of our models, we deploy our, uh, our code into the stage and to make sure everything can run okay. We just let the deployment go through and go get to the prod. And by doing that, we can avoid whatever we are trying to do uh, to break the, the production process. So that is how, like, uh, what we do in IPC. Um, I think um, the bank's case is more like what Rochelle uh, explained. We currently have certain um, constraints. Um, first off, our data is mostly batched. We have no real-time data. And some of that is because we don't have the infrastructure in place to kind of receive that real-time data, especially like for social media, we currently have no, you know, unstructured databases. So we're kind of limited in that respect. Um, so most of the models we do are reran on a monthly basis. And for the most part, um, since we're looking more at the customer, you know, segmentation, classification, and kind of their product, what products we can offer them, uh, most of those behaviors don't change day to day. They tend to be kind of consistent over a month or even six months. So we're lucky in that respect. Um, but for the most part, um, we're gonna, with the new um, enterprise data science platform we are procuring though, we're, we're gonna have to face those challenges and how we could um, redo the way we deploy and evaluate the models. Let's keep in touch. <laughs> okay, so a, a lot of companies you know, traditionally, especially larger and financial institutions, um, FPL as well, we had a lot of our data on premise. Um, and, and now we're looking at, you know, cloud technologies and looking at ways we can leverage them. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience using cloud technologies for machine learning as well as for maybe data consolidation? And what are some of the concerns around you know, maybe privacy, um, and how do you balance those with kind of the benefits of using this more scalable technology? Yeah, so um, we use AWS uh, as a lot of cloud stuff in terms of computing power. That's really, really helpful. Um, but we, we don't use any public cloud. S&P is, you know, I forget the number, but it gets like 600 million cyber attacks a day or something. <laughs> so, nope, can't do that. Yeah, so, because uh, in IPC, we already have our uh, Cloudera uh, data warehouse, but uh, we have been thinking about uh, using the cloud. But uh, there are three factors we have to really uh, consider. The first is the cost, uh, and I am pretty sure the cost is the primary factor for everybody, right? You don't want to spend too much money. And the second is the security. And the reason we are really concerned about the security is that uh, some of the data we have been receiving are the payment data and they are they have the financial information so we have to be very careful about that part and then the third is the performance because uh, we have been receiving the real time point the real time point of sales data at the daily basis and that data is massive. And on top of that, we also receive the, uh, the invoice data and the inventory data from the uh, distribution centers uh, on a daily basis as well. And besides that, we also receive the data from the manufacturer uh, about their inventory and their invoices. So combining all this data 
that sources together, we have to make sure uh, if we really migrate to the cloud, the performance can be assured because we don't. Uh, we want our users can uh, uh, access to the data warehouse and acquire the data uh, in a very efficient manner. Um, so out of the three of us, I would say um, I'm the least familiar with using cloud computing because currently all of our databases are on-prem. Um, mostly it's due to two factors. Um, that um, database decision doesn't rely in our group. It relies in the IT infrastructure area of our bank. And they, they currently see that we're, we're a community bank. So we're not, you know, Bank of America. We're not Chase. You know, we're not Wells Fargo. So we don't have a very uh, massive um, customer base. Uh, in order to kind of um, validate or justify going to cloud computing. And second portion, which is the biggest one, um, is the information security um, factor. Uh, you know, we know that many, um, many of these um, cloud computing um, um, providers, um, you know, assure it. However, though, the bank currently still feels it's in, still in its infancy for the most part, and it feels a lot safer having on-prem data. And just to provide a little bit of context on some of the answers that you've provided, can you tell us a little bit about how the data science team at your organizations is structured and how you interact with engineering and with kind of the business unit side? Sure. So, um, well, I'm not on the data science team specifically, but I'll speak to how it operates and then how my team operates. So they kind of operate in a bit of like a consultive uh, framework. So they'll pop into different parts of S&P and help with, you know, r building a model, running analysis, collecting data, uh, helping with different bits and pieces of the business. And then mine is a little bit similar, but it's more focused on ESG analytics. So um, half of my job is with my own clients and my, my portfolio of different clients who are interested in this analysis. The other half is product development. And then there's a small portion that works internally across those two frameworks. So um, other divisions that want to get better at e integrating ESG into their work, uh, like you know ratings for bonds and, and such like that. Um, so those are kind of, you know, how these teams work at, at our company. Uh, so at IPC, data science is uh, rather new. Uh, although I, I have been working with IPC about two years, but we just formed our data science team a year ago. And actually one of my, uh, my team members is sitting over there. Uh, so. So because, um, because to IPC, we are new, so we are kind of like sitting, uh, between, sitting in the middle. We interact with data engineers all the time. We fight with each other. <laughs> so, and also we interact with the business stakeholders all the time. So we collect a request and we decide what kind of analytic approach we will take. And, and then we interact with the data engineers to make sure they are okay with our deployment process. We don't interfere with any other ongoing process as well. So that is how it works. So, so we interact with both sides of the, of the company. Um, so in our area, um, it's called business intelligence analytics. So there's not a full data science team. I'm the data scientist only. Uh, but however, though, uh, my boss um, is the you know big data and you know business intelligence manager. And between him and my other peer and my supervisor of the area, um, we all have you know very intimate knowledge of all our data sources. So basically. Um, I guess the, my boss would do most of the data engineering, you could say share of the workload, and then the rest of us, me specifically, would do modeling, and then um, and someone else would do reporting, and another one would do dashboards for the most part. Um, and then the way the requests flow in is that, you know, they open a request um, to our business unit, and it could be from anyone. It could be from risk, compliance, um, product management, um, anyone in the bank that needs um, to find a solution to their challenges, and we kind of work First, sit down with them, understand um, what do they really need. Not uh, like what's their you know objective, what's the metrics that they need need to measure, and then based off that, we start working on whatever solution we think will be appropriate for them. Awesome. And, and before we wrap up um, the panel and kind of open it up for questions, um, what recommendations would you give to anyone, um, women or not, who are looking to enter the field of data science, um, whether locally for those that are, you know, local or, or somewhere else? 
Well, I think we all know you, you have to be kind of learning agile. You're always are learning, always doing new things. This field is rapidly evolving. So I think it's, you know, getting out there, learning what's possible, meeting other folks. Uh, I do think, you know, particularly in my field, domain knowledge is so, so important. Um, we stick to the data so closely. So the models are really important, but you need to be able to interpret things absolutely. Um, and this data is so new and it's so, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's spotty at times. And so there's a real need to understand what does that mean? Um, so for example, someone on my team um, who was newer to the space uh, came more from data science than ESG did an analysis about, um, sorry, uh, emissions and uh, coal plants and such. And she found that the largest correlative factor was mercury. She's like, oh, I, don't, I don't get it. Like, I don't know what's going on. Well, mercury is a byproduct from coal plant production. Um, and so that's a, a major reason why it's so prevalent in the environment. So that was a, a, a example of where you know, it's, it's really helpful to know the relationship of different data, particularly when you're working on it. And, and if you don't, to spend that time on the EDA process and really understand you know, what's, what's going on. So at IPC, actually, our team is addressed as a unicorn team. I don't know why. And then uh, my colleague told me because it's so hard to find a good data scientist. So, uh, and we do have many interns working with us, and they actually ask me what does a data scientist do. Uh, so my, my answer is uh, that totally depends on what kind of company you, you are working with or you will work uh, with. So if you're working with a high-tech company and pretty much you will work with all the data engineers uh, uh, all the time and your work will be focused on uh, algorithm uh, designing, developing, and deploy, deploying. And if you're working with a company like for, for instance like us and pretty much you have to learn how to uh, connect the data science knowledge to the real business uh, question and how to convert the abstract concepts into the business value measurement and how to deliver a data science story to the audience who are not coming from the, uh, the technical background. So uh, as a summary, I would say if you really, if you really, want, if you really want to get into this field, uh, prepare yourself with enough technical skills and the data science knowledge and uh, uh, get out there, try to explore as much as you can, get connected, and eventually you will get your own understanding of how a data science scientist should be. Yeah, and kind of like touching on those two points, I would say um, be fearless when applying to these positions. Um, I applied to the bank um, four years ago, I was only 22 and I had no knowledge of banking or financing at all. Um, luckily, um, if you do have strong foundations, your skills, um, I already had our experience before. I knew how to statistics and a little bit of um, higher skilled um, calculus. So based on those three facts and knowing how to use also SAS um, really gave me a leg up on the rest of the applicants. And they kind of worked with me to learn the data source, to learn the subject matter um, later on after I got hired. But for sure, be fearless. And if you never have any experience in that particular industry, just try applying. And then you do have to learn, though. This, like they previously said, um, you do have to keep on learning. And if you stop wanting to learn, um, you're going to get left behind. And your organization is not going to appreciate that because you're costing them um, potential revenue um, they could be making. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. And not only is it important to really uh, hone in on your technical skills, but to really hone in on your soft skills as well as data science starts to become prevalent in every industry and in every business unit. It's just only more and more critical for you to be able to communicate well um, and really be able to kind of manage a project and bring all of those pieces together. So um, I think you know, there's a place for everyone in the field if you have a passion uh, for data science and, um, you know, you really pursue it. And there are many ways to learn. So with that, I want to thank you all for staying um, to the end of our panel. And we're going to open it up for questions. I see some questions coming into Slack right now. <laughs> but let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for being part of this panel. Great.
Gracie asks, what kind of collaboration tools do you use to harness the team approach needed for data science? So I tried to get my team on Slack, and they just were not feeling it. <laughs> and now I don't think we're even allowed to use it. But um, we use Microsoft Teams. We use Skype for Business. Uh, Jupyter Lab is really nice. Everyone can see everybody else's code and just hop into their place and copy their notebook and start something new. So those are useful tools for us. We use the Slack as well. And uh, for sharing the code, we just use the Git as uh, the other people. And also, we create our own WhatsApp channel uh, to talk to each other after work. I think that really helps. <laughs> Although we try, to, uh, uh, we try not to talk too much work after the work time. So. <laughs> Yeah, I would echo on the WhatsApp and on the Skype. Um, Skype is definitely huge. Um, as well, um, every request we do, we kind of create um, like this subfolder in this big you know, request folder. And that way, if anyone needs to rerun anything, anyone's done, they just open that folder and you know, see the programs and the code that was created for that specific request and can rerun it. Um, but yeah, but like I said previously, we're procuring a data science um, platform that hopefully that could be more centralized and not rely on you know a G drive, share drive. And, and another tool we have been using is a smart sheet and uh, we can just uh, publish some uh, like the, the tables on the smart sheet to track uh, the progress of each project. At FPL and our parent company Nextera, we use the Atlassian stack. So we have Confluence, Bitbucket, um, and we kind of you know have documentation and code that anyone can access. Most of the time, sometimes you have to request the access. It's private, but that's what we use. That's great. Let's end a little bit early and let people go home. How about that? Or go to the reception. <laughs> Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>